Hello, hello, everybody. It's nice to be here today. Let's talk about uh, data-oriented programming with Java. And yeah, that's so one thing so exciting to to us. So if you would like to know more about the So Java group, So Java is uh, the biggest Java is a group around the world. So we have over uh, 30,000 people subscribed in our community list. And we are part of the JCP uh, as an executive member. And we have several Java communities around the world. So that's why we did an amazing trip around the world when, when we are able to. And but please follow us on Twitter at SoJava, Facebook at SoJava as well. So we have several news, several information about what's going on with Java, Jakarta EE, MicroProfile, and so on. But today is not to talk about SoJava, right? So today is to talk about the data-oriented programming. With okay, this one going to be hard to say, but hopefully I'm going to say it correctly this time. Uh, Yana Nathan, is that right? Hello? Almost, almost. Almost, okay. Could you say your name correctly, please? Yeah, my name is Yehonatan Sharvit. Wow, Yehonatan Sharvit. So hopefully I did that correctly. Okay, yeah. thank you. Pils, could you tell, tell a little bit about you? Sure. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for uh, having me here in the, this uh, great uh, group. And uh, I've been a dev software developer uh, since 2001, so it has been uh, 20 years. And in the beginning, I uh, coded mostly in C++. And then I discovered Java and JavaScript and Ruby, Python. And uh, for the last 10 years, I've been uh, mostly on the JVM with uh, Java and uh, Clojure. Um, <clears throat> And Clojure is an interesting language because on one hand it targets the JVM, like Scala, but the other, on the other hand it's a dynamically typed programming language, which is which makes a huge difference between uh, Clojure and, uh, and Java. And um, over the last two years, I've been uh, doing quite of research and discussion with the Clojure community to try to understand and formalize what's so special in, uh, in Clojure, what, make, what makes it uh, such a special language and different from other functional programming languages. And this is what we call data-oriented programming. And uh, today I'm gonna share with you how one could apply data-oriented programming, not only in Clojure, but also in Java. Oh, that's nice. Hello, Dan. Hello, Jackson. Please tell us where you're from. So right now yes, I'm, I'm from Brazil. I was born in Brazil, but right now I'm living in Portugal. So how about you? Yeah, so I was born in France 40 years ago, 42 years ago. Uh, and uh, right now I live in Israel. Oh, and, nice. uh, yeah, and I work as a software engineer for a company here in Israel. Oh, nice. So, so today we're gonna talk about data-oriented program, right? So, yeah. So that's your show. So I'm gonna leave you here. Everybody, if you have any question, please write down in the comments. So after uh, the presentation, gonna bring these questions. Okay. Great. That's your show. Okay. So hello, everybody. And uh, today we are going to, to talk about how to reduce system complexity in Java with data-oriented programming. And uh, the subtitle of the talk is Taming Objects. So objects are uh, great. Uh, Java embraces uh, object-oriented programming. But uh, sometimes or quite often, objects are a source of complexity. And data-oriented programming is a way to tame this complexity so that we can um, enjoy the most uh, our uh, objects. You can uh, follow me on Twitter. This is my Twitter handle. Um, let's start. Oops. Let me refresh my screen, just a second. 
Okay. So as I said uh, before, I've been a software developer since 2001, mostly in C++, Java, JavaScript, uh, Ruby, uh, Clojure. Uh, I'm the author of the book called Data Oriented Programming. And I, uh, I'm a blogger at blog.clips.tech. Okay, so what is uh, data oriented programming? So first of all, let me say it's not something new. It's not something that I invented. It's not something that Clojure invented. It's something that is, uh, I would say, well known by uh, many uh, professional uh, Java developers or Java experts. And I would say that it's a set of best practices that allow us to reduce the complexity of information systems by treating data as a first class citizen. Mm, let me tell you what do I mean by complexity. So in the context of software engineering, we have two kinds of complexity. We have the computational complexity, which is the amount of resources that are required to run a program the time it takes to run a program or the memory it takes to run a program. And we have the system complexity, which is the amount of brain resources that are required to understand the program. And in the context of this talk, when I mention complexity, I am referring only to the system complexity. So it has nothing to do with making uh, our applications more performant. It has to do with making our applications easier for us, the developers, to understand, to maintain, to debug, to evolve, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And data-oriented programming is uh, especially useful for information systems. And uh, information systems are systems where we uh, the system manipulate information in various ways where information is at the core of the system for example web services that fetch data from the database does a bit of manipulation and serve this data as json or xml or whatever another example are is web workers that listen to events from kafka or rabbitmq and reach the events with data from other sources, merge the data, and pass the data forward to another uh, queue or worker or write the data to the, the enriched data to the database. And another set of examples is front end applications, complex front end applications. For example, applications that run in the browser, where those applications need to store and manage uh, a complex application state. So what usually makes an information system uh, complex? Let's take, for example, uh, a library management system. Imagine we need to build uh, a library management system in Java. If you are a regular Java developer and uh, you don't use uh, too many design, smart design patterns, you would come up probably with uh, a design and a class diagram like the one on the screen. So you would have classes like library, user, catalog, books, member, book item, book lending, etc. And there would be relationships between the, the classes. And this is just a small uh, zoom out at the, this, the class diagram of the system. But already you can see that this diagram is quite complex. And why is it complex? It is complex because, first of all, we have nodes in the, this diagram with many edges. Take, take a look, for example, at the librarian class. Uh, on one hand, it inherits from user. On the other hand, it is used by catalog. On the other hand, it is uh, part of the composition relation with library. Etc. Etc. You have one, two, three, four, five, six. Librarian is involved in six relationship with classes, and it makes uh, the class diagram complex. Another source of complexity is the fact that we have many kind of arrows in our diagram. We have many kind of relationship. We have 
association, we have composition, we have inheritance, we have usage, and this is, uh, I would say, a burden on our mind. Uh, when we need to build this class diagram to design our system, but also when we need to understand the system, to, for example, to add a new feature. And this is quite common in a classic or in a traditional object-oriented uh, program like Java to have uh, this plethora of, of classes and relationships and complex systems. So one way to tame this complexity is first to separate between code and data. And let me show you what happens when we take the exact same diagram, like the one on the previous slide, and we split each class into two different classes, one that holds the code and one that holds the data. I'm going to show you in a moment how we can do that in Java. But in terms of complexity, uh, look at what happened right now. Instead of uh, entangled system in the left, we have two beautiful or two simple disjoint system where the relationships in the left diagram are quite straightforward or simple, not complex, and the same on the right diagram. And what makes it, what makes the system on the right less complex? First of all, because we have a separation of concerns. We have entities that deal with code and entities that deal with data. And separation of concerns is a great way to reduce system complexity. Another thing that makes the system on the right less complex is that the kind of arrows on the left are restricted. We have only usage relation with the dot lines here on the left. And on the right, we have only association <coughs> with the plain diamond or, sorry, association with the empty diamond or composition with the plain diamond. So we the kind of, re of relationships in the left diagram are not the same as the kind of relationships on the right diagram, and it makes our system uh, less complex. So first principle from data-oriented programming is that by separating code from data, we reduce com system complexity. And let me show you how we do that in Java. So for example, the author class, instead of having data encapsulated in one class and method that provide access to the data that is hidden or encapsulated in the class, we would have one class for the data, the author data class that holds only data, for example, first name and last name of the author, and uh, a class called author code that holds only static methods that provide access and logic uh, on the data. And notice here that the data is not hidden or encapsulated in the class. It is passed as an argument to the static methods of the class. So for example, the full name method, you can see that it's a static method, will receive the author data as an argument and access data from the author data explicitly. And how we use the this or we access data and classes as a consumer as a consumer so first we instantiate data for example isaac asimov and then we get an object that is an instance to the author data class and when we want to do data manipulation or calculation on the data we call the static method full name and we pass to it the data uh, asimov and it returns isaac asimov as a full name So that's the first way that uh, we have to reduce system complexity in data-oriented programming. The second way, uh, in order for me to explain that, that, let's take a look at another source of complexity. What makes code hard to understand? One thing that always um, makes me thrown in Java is to think about whether the arguments are passed by reference or by value when I call them uh, a method. And the answer is that in Java, object references are passed by value. 
And I find this definition quite uh, hard to, to understand. I always need to think twice before I understand exactly what does it mean by this, uh, this sentence. So let me give you a concrete example. Let's say that we have Asimov that holds the author data and that we call author code in order to get uh, the last name of Asimov but uppercase. So now we have Asimov 2 that contains the same data as Asimov, but the last name is uppercase. So obviously the last name in Asimov 2 is Asimov uppercase. But now the question is, what is the last name of the first Asimov, of the original uh, object? And when you look at this code, you have no way to decide. It's, you cannot know. You can either trust the implementation of two upper last names that it didn't mutate the, the, the data that you passed to it, or you can make a defensive copy. And before you pass Asimov to the method to upper last name, you copy, and then you are sure that the original object is untouched. But anyway, it makes the code hard to understand, and you have boilerplate code, or, or you need to, to think twice before you understand what happens de uh, there. And the problem is that object references are passed by value. So this method to upper last name, on one hand, it receives a reference to Asimov, or a value to the reference of Asimov, but on the other hand, it has the possibility to mutate the members of uh, Asimov's object. So one way to, to reduce this, sorry, and when you are so in a multi-threaded environment, it's even worse. Take a look at this example. So let's say we have a member data in our uh, library, and it has one member, a Boolean member, <coughs> sorry, a Boolean member named blocked that holds information about whether the member is blocked or not. When the member is blocked, it is, it is forbidden for her to borrow a book. And look at this naive code that looks very, very simple. The borrow function that receives a member and a book ID to borrow and that does a simple check if the member is not blocked you allow the user to uh, borrow the book here i i print to the console the book is yours and actually in a multi-threaded environment this code is buggy this code is not thread safe why because there could be a context switch between the this line that check whether the member is blocked so when you check the member is not blocked but when you go to the next line in another thread, the member becomes blocked. So this program is not correct if it runs in a multi-threaded environment. How do we solve that? We add lock mechanism. So we would have a lock around this critical section, which makes sure that once you check that the author is blocked, no thread is allowed to unblock or to block the, the member. And it makes, again, the code very hard to understand and there are deadlocks and, and you, you need to think a lot about where, what section you protect with a lock, one global lock, multiple locks, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you are familiar with this uh, kind of complexity. So data-oriented programming has a very, very straightforward solution to this problem, which is you treat data as value. Values never change. If you don't allow uh, the data to change, you don't have the problem like I showed here and in the previous slide, because data never, because values never change. And you probably heard that lots of time uh, in many blog posts about Java that uh, explain why immutable data is beneficial. And the most, the, the biggest benefits of uh, working only with immutable data is that we are inherent, our programs are inherently thread safe. Immutable data is inherently thread safe because by definition you cannot mutate the data. And also there, they, there are no hidden side effects. And it makes our program much less complex. So let me show you now, now two ways to achieve 
uh, immutable data in Java. Like you probably know, every problem in Java can be solved with uh, Java annotations. Java annotations are a great uh, mechanism to, to save from us the need to write uh, boilerplate code. And there is this great uh, project Lombook that provides lots of J uh, Java annotation. annotations. One of them is the value annotation. And look at, the, look at that. If you take a simple class, a regular Java class with two members, first name and last name, and you add the value annotation, what happens is that you get uh, auto-generation of a constructor. The members are immutable. You get getters and setters auto-generated, and also the regular two-string hash code and equals methods. So when you add the value annotation to a data class, it makes the data automatically immutable. And uh, Java core team has, has been aware of the need for providing an easy way for us, the Java developers, to create immutable data. So since Java 14, they provide a way to create what's called a, rec a record. Uh, and when you use a record, you get the same thing as what the project Lombok provides you, but it's now native in Java. You don't need any Java annotation. And uh, I think that when Java 14 become, <coughs> becomes uh, widely available in production, it will be a great way to reduce the complexity of our, uh, our programs. So as I, as I told you in the, in the beginning, uh, data oriented programming is not uh, a new paradigm. It's a paradigm that has been embraced for years by uh, experts from, I would say, every language, and in particular Java. And it, it's great to see that even the Java core team acknowledged the need for providing ways to make uh, data oriented programming easier to embrace in a language like Java. So let me show you now the, the concrete benefits of using immutable data in Java. So here is, again, the same example as before. We instantiate uh, author data for Isaac Asimov. But now, when we call this function, author code to upper last name on Asimov, so we get a new version of Asimov called here Asimov2. But we know for sure that the original data in Asimov has not been touched. And we have this guarantee even without the need to look at the code of two upper last names. Because Asimov is an immutable data, we know for sure that the data has not been mutated. And that makes a huge, uh, it simplifies a lot the, for us. It simplifies, makes it much easier for us to understand what's going on in the program when we know what piece that the pieces of data cannot be modified by uh, methods. So we don't have mutations. We don't have unpleasant surprises. We don't need defensive copy. And we don't need mutexes. And we get all those benefits only when we constrain our data to be immutable, either with uh, Lombok value annotation or with Java records that are available since Java 14. Um, no race condition, we don't need to protect with the lock. In a single threaded environment, it, we don't have surprises. In a multi threaded environment, we don't have surprises. It makes it uh, simpler to uh, migrate a single threaded application to become multi threaded. Lots, lots of benefits, and the cost is not so high. We just need to make sure that our data is uh, immutable. And let me uh, share with you a couple of libraries, of Java libraries that make, makes it even easier to embrace data-oriented programming. So one library is JSON by Google. And JSON is a Java serialization and deserialization library that converts Java objects into JSON, JSON back and forth. So you could take any Java objects. And there is a, a method in JSON 
to JSON string, and it will use reflection to create a JSON string with the members, with the values of the members inside your Java class. And it goes, it works also in the other direction. You could have a JSON string, for example, that you receive from a client request, and you could pass it very easily into, um, into a Java object or into a Java, a Java map. So that's one example. Another great example is the CQ engine that allows you to, to uh, load in the memory of your application data from an SQL database and then manipulate and then query the data in memory. So sometimes instead of sending again and again the same query and caching to the database, you, it makes more sense to download all the data in your application, to fetch it in your application, and then you can very, very, uh, in a very efficient way, query the data like SQL in, uh, in memory. But for that, to allow Java objects to be uh, queried with SQL syntax, you need quite, you need quite of smart code with reflections or attributes, or there are lots of tricks that uh, this amazing library does. Another example of, of a Java library that embraces data authentic programming is Paguro, that provides efficient uh, implementation of immutable data structures. So what is an immutable data structure? Let's say you have, um, let's say you have a big uh, hash map with, uh, I don't know, thousands or tens of thousands of, of nested fields. And now you want to modify one field in the map. And you want to do that in an immutable way. So the naive way to do that is to do a deep clone of the original map and then to modify the field in the new map. But obviously the, the performance cost is high, both in terms of computation and in terms of memory. So usually it's, uh, it, we cannot afford to do that. But fortunately, there, are, there have been uh, papers published around the 2005 that provides a way to do efficient immutable uh, data manipulation. And Paguro implements uh, this uh, algorithm. And another library that also implements the algorithm, this algorithm, the efficient implementation of persistent data structures here is Bifurcan. There are slight differences between the two. I invite you to compare. I think that Bifurcan is even more performant than Paguro, but maybe Paguro is a bit simpler uh, to use. And Paguro also allows you to do uh, stream uh, data manipulation with Lambda a bit uh, more convenient than the, the, the way it's provided by uh, Java native. So anyway, that are some examples and uh, there are plenty uh, more out there of libraries that embrace data oriented programming. So uh, as I say, I, I, uh, I wrote a book called Data Oriented Programming that uh, summarized, summarizes what are the, the core principles of data oriented programming and how we can apply them in uh, many different languages. It could be JavaScript, Ruby, Python, Clojure, Java, C Sharp. And in the book, I take more time to illustrate the benefits and the cost of each of the principles that uh, we have dealt with uh, in, uh, in the session. And also I spend lots of time to explain how to use immutable collections, how to represent record data with immutable maps, how to do polymorphism without inheritance, how to manage the application state. Managing the application, the application state is tricky because the state is inherently mutable. So it seems like a contradiction to be able to, mani to manage application state via uh, immutable data structures, but there is a way to do that. And when we do that, we get a system, a concurrent system that is highly scalable 
and uh, and also data and the programming provides a flexible way to access the database, whether it's a relational database or a NoSQL uh, database. So if you are uh, interested in this, uh, in going deeper with these materials, I invite you to take a look at, uh, at the book. It's published by Manning. So let me summarize uh, what we have uh, covered. So what is, how we could apply or how people have applied data and programming in Java over the years. First of all, we separate code from data. Code lives only in classes with static methods. We don't allow code uh, as instance methods. And data, we want only immutable data. We don't allow mutable data. And there are two ways to achieve that, either with value annotation provided by Lombok project or with records that are available since Java uh, 14. So that's in a nutshell what I had uh, to share with you. Um, uh, I'm uh, open for uh, Q&A, so please share questions either on YouTube or whatever I can, we, we could stay together for uh, another uh, 15 minutes or so. Tell me what you think, do you find it useful? Are you already uh, embracing you by yourself data-oriented programming? Is that new for you? for you? Does it sound easy to apply those principles? Does it sound hard, trivial? Please, uh, please share your uh, experience. So, Otavio, I'm done. You can open the, the Q&A. Oh, okay, okay. That's a nice presentation, Jahan. Uh, okay, Yasser said, please finish the chapter faster. And yeah, that's an amazing book. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to do not only fast, I want to do it in a way that it's it's fun to read, so that's uh, difficult to do it uh, both fast and uh, fun to read. But I'm I'm happy to see that you enjoy the book so far. So and I think that in a, in the upcoming days, chapter five is going to be released about how to achieve uh, high concurrent systems. That's the information I got from the publisher uh, yesterday. Okay, okay. Is there any questions? Okay, let's see. There is no further questions. Uh, thank you, Erhan. That was an amazing presentation. Uh, could you share the link here also? Let me check here. Yes, so, I can share the, the link to the presentation. Yes, please do. So you can use the private chat so I can share yeah. on the YouTube and also put in the description. And let me share the link with the, to the book also. Yes. So you can access this link here, the presentation in, yes, the book here. If there is no further question, Hopefully you enjoyed this presentation and see you soon here at the Soul Java channel. Thank you, Yaha. Thank you, Otavio. It was a pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye.